Catholic Church use these verses to justify infant baptism? Huh? These are one of the proof texts that our church uses to justify infant baptism. Do you see it? Do you see it? Do you not? Do we, should we not even bother with these verses and say, there's nothing any good here for infant baptism? What, how do All right, so the, the, the statements you made there, they need forgiveness and love as well. In other words, in Matthew, Mark chapter 10, are children incapable of receiving the blessings of God? No. That's why this text is used. Um, and the Greek word is uh, adia here. And what medical word do we get from the Greek adia? Pediatrics. Pediatrics. So you kind of all know when pediatrics, you're talking what age group, you're talking very kind of young age group here. And what did the disciples think about these children? What do you think? What did the disciples think about these children? They were a bother and they were incapable of learning anything. So why should they be here? Because the disciples were doing what? <clears throat> they were pushing them away. Uh, the disciples, the strong word there was rebuke them. Disciples rebuked them. And what kind of response did Jesus have at the disciples' behavior? Indignant, angry, because the disciples so misunderstood that the kingdom of God belongs to who? Little ones. All right. So how do we do this with infant baptism? Why are these verses helpful to defend infant baptism? Yeah, one of the challenges of infant baptism is that God bestows blessings upon us. And you think about comparing the sacrament of the altar with the sacrament of baptism here. God bestows blessings in the sacrament of the altar. God bestows blessings in the sacrament of baptism. But in order for these gifts in the sacrament of the altar be blessings and not cursing, Luther says one must have faith. Faith. Now, this is where the challenge happens. We understand 13-year-old, 14-year-old can have faith so that they can receive the sacrament with blessings and not cursings. But we challenge that with babies, right? Can babies have faith to receive the blessings? Yeah, I mean, the simple answer is probably just leave it as yes right now. <laughs> exactly. You know, we cannot by our own reason or strength believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, right there in the meaning of the third article. So faith is a creation of who? Man and God, man alone, God alone. God alone. So it comes down to this. Can God create faith in the heart of a baby? Yes. That's, he can do anything. That's where we go with this. In order for the baby to really see the blessings of baptism, it's got to have ability to have faith to grasp the blessings of baptism. Does it have capability of faith? Not on its own, not in cooperation. It's all God doing, which means that this gift of faith is an act of grace. Grace, grace, grace. The baby is not going to receive the blessings of baptism without faith. But God puts faith in there. Do you remember how Luther says it in the third article? How's, how's water do such great things? It doesn't do it alone, but it is the word of God along with. Come on, people. You know your catechism, right? No, 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 no. This third article, uh, it is not water that does, but it is the word of God along with faith. 
which trust such promises of God. Luther's always kind of said that you have to have faith to receive the blessings. You just don't. He was speaking against the Roman church because in the Roman Catholic church, they said, you just do it and you get it. You don't have to have faith. As long as you put no obstacle before your sacrament, it just, it just happens. Luther says, no, there's got to be faith in order to be a worthy receiver of the blessings, but never attribute faith as something man does. It is something that God does. I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel. Why do we put age limit on the sacrament of the altar? Good question. <laughs> What's this? See, there's the difference between the sacrament of the altar and the sacrament of baptism. Is that there is no examination needed for baptism. No examination. But if you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11, it says one must examine and discern. Okay, so now we're talking about human, um, human traits here. So one must be able to examine themselves and discern the body and blood of Christ to receive the sacrament working man. It is faith, which is a gift, but now in the sacrament of the altar, St. Paul, examine and discern. And again, I talked about this last week. Where would the church be if we didn't have the Pauline epistles? You know, I mean, uh, it would be more carefree, a whole bunch of stuff. But Paul gets very, very specific about doctrine. And you would only have to come to this conclusion that you believe St. Paul is an inspired writer, that God wanted more specifics on the doctrine. Otherwise, he would not have endorsed Paul to do what he did. So that's the difference between examine and discernment. So I, I think I might have shared this controversy. I don't know if it happens in Indiana, in Texas, what is happening in Indiana, uh, where pastors were communing kids uh, three years old, Lutheran, Missouri Synod kids, three, three, five, six years old. Um, and for some reason, the circuit counselors were asking me, how do you, how do you speak against that? I'm like, why are you asking me? I don't have all the answers on that. I, I, I basically, though, responded to this. I responded to it with this way. Um, faith is always a gift of God. And in the sacrament of the altar, it needs examination and discernment. So it does seem like there needs to be some maturity level in the receiving of the sacrament of the altar so that they do not receive it unworthily. Uh, if, if discernment was not necessary for the sacrament of the altar, if discernment was not necessary, would we practice closed communion? No. Come up, believe whatever you want to believe, it's all good to go. So we really emphasize in the same words of St. Paul that no, there is a requirement here, there's a discernment. One of the things that I found fascinating in the liturgy of baptism in the blue hymnal, the one that came out in 1982, 80, 1990, <coughs> or whatever it was. Yeah, it was 82. 1982, the blue hymnal. It says this. Because a child cannot answer for him or herself, we shall all on behalf of parents and sponsors answer these questions on behalf. It communicates the fact that this community is taking responsibility for the faith and the upbringing of the faith of this child. That, that, that makes sense for me, I guess. You look at the new hymnal, which is in the pews right now, go to the order of baptism, the agenda for baptism in the new hymnal, uh, 2008, and that question has been removed. The pastor, I, I still will ask it today, and, and the, the, uh, the grandchild of Kimberly's baptism here today, because I think it's necessary to communicate a message that we as a congregation have some responsibility as a community of Christ for the faith of the child and for the instruction that's just not left on the mother of the child alone um, or the parent, mother or father. It's, it's the community. And see, this is what this church, this is what these pastors were arguing. That, all right, if we make this confession in baptism that we have to answer 
for the child, why cannot the community answer for the child at the communion rail? And to that question, I told the counselors, we have no answer. The only answer I have is I'm not comfortable with it. I just, I just can't go there. But there are guys that do. And I, with that situation, I'm at a situation with both pastors where we just have to agree to disagree. I can't go there with you. You know, I understand your argument, can't support it. Like the community cannot accept the responsibility of the faith of the infant in baptism. Um, the Orthodox Church to this day continues to baptize and commune infants. Um, they kind of put those sacraments together. The Roman Catholic Church, uh, when do they start communing? Seven years old. Seven years old. What? Um, no, they, they they have instructions. If anybody Roman Catholic converts in our church here, uh, is there not some preparatory instruction before you receive your first communion? Yes, yes. So there is there is preparatory instruction to understand what's going on. And when I ask a Roman Catholic priest about early communion, and my question was, how in the world do you think a seven-year-old can understand transubstantiation? Because it says in the Bible that you must discern. Can a seven-year-old discern your view of the sacrament of the altar? Can a seven-year-old understand transubstantiation? That is such an abstract concept that was way too challenging for a seven-year-old mind. And his response to me was eye-opening. This was back in the 80s. He, he said, we don't expect our children to understand transubstantiation. Okay, I said, go on. He said, we expect our children, before they receive the sacrament of the altar in our church, this one simple knowledge, that when that bell rings, that's the body of Christ. Yeah. <laughs> that's, and I says, okay. That's, that's all they require, that they, they work them through the liturgy a little bit, and they want them to know that when the priest uh, consecrates and the bell rings, it is no longer bread, it is the body of Christ. That's all we ask, and that child is ready for the sacrament of the altar. We don't expect them to know transubstantiation. That is going to be later taught in confirmation when they're, you know, in 11th grade. Um, so we have a difference because we want our communicants to know the doctrine of, what's our doctrine called? Lutherans are wrong. Come on, you should, this is just bang right there. Real presence. Doctrine of real presence. And what is that doctrine of real presence? Again, putting all you good Lutherans on the spot here. Real yeah. presence believes what? Yeah. With <laughs> the bread and wine. The body and blood of Christ is in, with, and under the bread and wine. How that is, we don't know. We just received Jesus' words for what it is the body and blood. Jesus said, This is my body. This is my blood. He doesn't say this symbolizes. He doesn't say it represents. He says this is St. Paul in 1 Corinthians 10 and 11. He basically says the same thing. The body is communing with the bread. The blood is communing with the wine. So therefore there is a communion in the elements. There is a real presence of the very body and blood of Christ in with and under the bread and wine. Um, we in our church body feel that a, the a communicant must know this in order to receive the communion for blessings and not for cursings because if the communicant does not know this that the body and blood of christ is in with and under the bread and wine what is what is happening to the communicant according to what saint paul says they are drinking unworthy judgment upon themselves now that's not an act of love to allow people to drink judgment to themselves of course, a lot of people don't understand our, our doctrine. We don't have a whole bunch of time to explain it to visitors when they come in three minutes before the bell rings. Um, and uh, very, very difficult to say, this is a statement of love in three minutes. Very, very difficult, very challenging. Uh, but that's where we're at. One other thing that I found fascinating is the Roman Catholic Church, it's basically based out of, it, its culture is based basically on Italian. And the German culture, I mean, Lutheran culture is based on Germany. When I was doing this research again, I found this interesting. Do you know what the age of reason was understood to be in Italy? Age of reason? 
seven. Age, uh, age of reason in Germany, 14. Confirmation and communion follows those patterns in our church this day. And now you know why. People are like, why do we wait till 14? Well, it's tradition. Why is that tradition? Well, because in Germany, age of reason was understood to be 14. Why in Italy are they doing it at seven? Because of tradition. Why is it? Because the age of reason was understood to be at seven. Um, and it's just affected the doctrinal practices. It just does. Uh, of what you believe about your culture affects your faith. I don't see how you can say it does not. Your culture affects your faith. So that's that's where the crux is at. There are, are some pastors, you know, that really are still pushing the envelope on early communion um, up to three, four, five years old, wanted to get down. And the truth of the matter, and, and this is where, where everyone must answer this, and just what Jesus says here, right? Jesus says here, should we be holding children from the blessings of the kingdom of God? Probably shouldn't if they were capable. Jesus says, these kids are capable of receiving the blessings that I want to give them in this manner. So everybody's got to sit down and ask themselves, <clears throat> is there a universal age where we can be comfortable in determining when a child can receive the blessing of the sacrament. Does it really ever say in the sacrament, you must know all the six chief parts of the Lord's, of Luther's small catechism before you receive the Lord's? Can anybody show me that Bible verse? It's not there. It's just, what, what must you, what must they know? They must be able to discern the body and blood of Christ and examine themselves. If, if, the, if, the, if a child can be capable of doing that, you want to withhold them from receiving these blessings. That's where everyone must do a gut check here. Um, don't want to withhold blessings from the children when they are really capable of receiving them. So when you look at Martin Luther in his time, how did he handle this? Did he did he use a certain age for communion saying, you're not going to get confirmed until you're 14? I don't know. How, well, I don't know how he had the time, but maybe because he didn't have Facebook and television. But <laughs> he met with every one of those kids. And I tell you, he communed them when he said they were good and ready. He didn't wait till they were 14 years old. He examined them to say, can you understand real presence? Can you examine yourself and make confession of your sins? And if you can, welcome to the rail. For me to hold you back from blessings you can really receive would be a sin. Come to the rail. So he went, he, he did individual confirmation. Indiv yeah, well, I tried. I tried some years ago to do individual confirmation. And uh, it, it was it was working okay because the fact is, what is individual confirmation? Where does the onus fall when you start individual confirmation? Where does it really fall on the parents? Because if you do individual confirmation and stuff with individual communion, I had mom and dad in on those classes and I really communicated the message. And I try to do the confirmation of the day that we are, the church does a service. The church is not ultimately responsible for the spiritual welfare of your child. That is upon the household. We are here as a service to serve you and your family. We are not in charge. We are not in charge. And, and then when the family takes that responsibility and says, you know, I, I think my child's ready for communion. And I said, okay, well then let's sit down and talk and let's, and let's let's do these classes and go through them and then we'll we'll examine. And then when the classes were done, I asked the parents, do you think your child's ready for communion? I put that again on them, not on me. They become their ultimate responsibility. Um, but with early communion, I always made this up there when I started it up in Indiana. I always say you cannot take early communion classes without taking a vow you will see the child through confirmation. Because what can happen when you start during early communion? What happens to confirmation? It just, just drops down. So no parent could sign up for early communion unless they signed a piece of paper that they would see this child through confirmation and learn the other five chief parts of the Lord, of, of, of Luther's small catechism. So um, it, I, I don't know what they're doing up there now, but it was working very successfully up, up in Indiana. One of the great things, too, is that when the children were communing early, we started at sixth grade. That was as early as I would go, sixth grade. Uh, 
So the children is communing during the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade confirmation and three years of confirmation instruction. We have two. Um, so what is happening to them through three years of confirmation instruction? They are doing what? They are receiving the sacrament every Sunday. They're receiving these blessings of God, which the parents and I have said, yeah, they can do it. They've got it. They got it figured out. They can get a God forbid us from holding something they can receive. So they're doing it. And so by the time they're, they're done with confirmation, they've had three years of communion at the table. And then they go to their friend's non-denominational church and go a couple Sundays. And what do you think they're going to miss there? What are they going to probably know? This happened up in Indiana. When, when these people did three years and got confirmed, they would go, in high school, you're going to go with your friends to church. What do you think some of these kids said to me when they were communing early and then went to a non-denominational service? They're not, they're not, they're, 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 they're missing something. They're missing something. I've been taking communion for three years and a church doesn't seem to be a church without the offering of the sacrament. But you see, if you don't have the kids having communion for three years during the communion process, confirmation process, so they go to non-denominational certs and there's not communion there, do they really even notice they're missing? They didn't receive it before. So that's one of the greatest benefits is, is getting the kids in the habit, receiving these blessings of God to help them really truly formulate what worship is, what it involves. Uh, that, that worship is word and sacrament. It's not just word. So if they are able to examine and discern, as St. Paul says in Luke chapter, I mean, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we, we have to make sure we're not holding these kids back from blessings they can receive. So, um, but here, you know, we, we've, we've, moved, we've moved communion up a little bit uh, because of the fact that I, I really want to straight the message that a lot of times people look at confirmation as basically it's a ticket to the rail. And no, confirmation is more than that. Confirmation is being given more than license to the communion rail. Confirmation is, yes, I believe in the six chief parts. Yes, I want to be part of this congregation. Yes, this is the faith in which I want to uphold. It's more than just receiving the sacrament. So to help the child understand that confirmation is something more distinct than communion, although communion is the greatest blessing, but confirmation and communion, when you put them together, the human mind sometimes just associates that, they, they, that they, they, they're like this and they really aren't. They really need to be separated. And the Roman Catholic Church, well, they really do it well because, right, seven years old and they don't confirm until they're juniors in high school. Um, so that's, every board of elders and pastors got to work through that. Any, any questions, you know? Lance, does that kind of address what you're talking about? Yeah. Yeah. The day examination. Yeah. Pastor, in a matter of concern, I, I think we had this discussion some time ago. What level of Cognizance or lack thereof, do you communicate that? Well, I, with, the, with people who are dealing with dementia uh, or diagnosed with Alzheimer's, the, for many, many years they're receiving the sacrament, and they kind of really know. So, what I do is I take my communion kit, and some days the people with dementia are right on, and some days they're off. And so I will. I will open my communion kit and they can see the wine and the bread. And I said, would you like to have this today? And if they say, yes, I'm, I'm good with this. I'm going. But if they look at that wine and the bread and they're like, I like, no, not a good idea today. Not a good idea. You know, um, I will just do word and prayer because cannot just the word and prayer bring the blessings of God to this person who's in that state of faith, just like they're, they're they return to the state of infancy. And so God's word works. We, infant baptism really helps us deal with people in dementia. Uh, the fact that we believe God's word is effective without people even having to really be logical and cognizant of it. If that was the case, we couldn't be baptizing babies. So to me, infant baptism just really <clears throat> intensifies our ministry for those with dementia and understanding God's word's power. So. My daughter was baptized twice, but when we served the pastor, she was in the hospital, she had to be put on a ventilator, and he decided he wanted to come to the hospital with her. Mm -hmm. But then he told me that we should have official baptism with the church. Yeah. So I was young at the court, so yeah. I just 
trusted in what you know was given. Yeah. And I, to this day, I didn't understand the fact that if a baptism is supposed to be, why would why we would like why did we do it at the hospital than in the church? Well, you you were right. Your pastor was wrong. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, did he have water when he baptized in the hospital? To be honest, I don't think so. Oh. I really don't believe I, I, It was so long ago, but I don't. Yeah. I was young. Well, if he didn't have water, then it wasn't a valid baptism. You have to have water in the word. Um, but in emergency baptisms, there's there's an agenda in our liturgy that if I were to do a baptism in an emergency situation, the child does live that I would then do a service in the church acknowledging before the congregation that a baptism was validly done. I would not redo a baptism, but I would be I would give a testimony in this congregation. This child was validly baptized in the hospital under my supervision with the word and the, and, and the water, and they are now part of our membership and our responsibility. And, and that actually, that's what we, we've been taught to do for years. I don't know where he might have missed the boat on. Would you be a pastor in that hospital? No, it does not have to be a pastor. Well, you always got water. Yeah. With, uh, <laughs> with a former church and a nurse, that's not a good job. Right. Yeah, if the nurse did it and it was done validly, the pastor would say, this, yeah, this, this baptism has been validly with water and the word. It's a valid baptism in an emergency situation. So this child's been validly baptized. Yes. It, it doesn't have to be a pastor. We call it, if you look in the back of the hymnal, it'll also basically show you the right for emergency baptisms. That's why everyone should probably have a hymnal at their house. Hopefully you don't have to do emergency baptism, but there's so many devotional aspects in the hymnal that we miss out because we just let it collect dust in the pew. There's a lot of great stuff there for your devotional life in the hymnal. With, with the ceremony of Yeah, I think it, I think that's part of it. Yeah, that this congregation is going to be responsible. Yes, I think that's part of it. Yeah, yeah, that they acknowledge that we receive uh, responsibility for the child. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of stuff there and discussion on just a few Bible verses. Uh, anything else on this before we before we move on? Right, right, yeah. Life is life for us from conception. What do they say? From womb to tomb. Womb to tomb is what we wish to defend. And this week has been the March for Life, right? So a lot of Lutherans in Washington, D.C. right now. Is it? I don't know. I mean, I, the news doesn't share this information with us because they really don't want you to know how much uh, support there is for, for life. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They kind of really keep that really, really quiet, our, our marches for life. Uh, they don't really get it out much. Um, okay, that's, that's good, good, good. Hopefully uh, you got some things to think about there and uh, be able to defend your faith. We just talked about the word, the, the uh, Christian word for defensive faith is apologetics. Uh, we're going to now take a look at Mark 17, Mark 7, 10, 17, excuse me, 10, 17, and the rich man, the rich man, Mark 10, 17, 31, as Jesus was going forth into the way, there ran one to him and kneeled to him and asked him, good master, what shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? And Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one, even God. You know the commandments. Do not kill, do not commit adultery, do not steal, do not bear false witness, do not defraud, honor your father and your mother. And he said unto him, Master, all these things have I observed them from my youth. And Jesus, looking upon him, loved him and said unto him, One thing you lack, go and sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you shall have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. But his countenance fell at the scene, and he went away sorrowful, for he is one that had great possession. And Jesus looked round about, said unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? 
The disciples were amazed at his word, but Jesus answered again and said unto him, Children, how hard it is for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God. It is easier for a camel to go through a needle's eye than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished exceedingly, saying unto him, Then who can be saved? Jesus looked upon them and said, With men it is impossible, but not with God, for all things are possible with God. Peter began to say unto him, Lord, we've left all and followed you. Jesus said, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house or brothers or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for my gospel's sake, but that he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses and brethren, uh, sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecutions and in the world to come eternal life. But many that are first shall be last and the last first. There's a, a lot in this discussion here today. Um, there's three of them. And in one of these readings, uh, Jesus is not addressed as good. You know, uh, in Matthew 19, the rich man just says, Master, what good thing shall I do? But in Mark 10 and Luke, this guy addresses him as the good master. And how does Jesus respond to that title? Nobody's good. Nobody's good but God. So process this a little bit. Nobody's good but God. Why did not Jesus, is Jesus God? Okay, so why didn't Jesus accept the title? Uh-huh. But with this guy, what was this guy failing to recognize? Huh? That he, that he was God. You're, you're calling me a good master, but you have to recognize the only one that is good is God. And I know you're not telling me I'm God. So he's challenging him on recognizing that he is good only in the sense of being human. But Jesus says, there is no one good but God alone. And I know you're not making that confession with me. So he needs to help this person understand what? Not only about his divinity, but as you can see in the dialogue, he needs to help this person understand what about himself? He's sinful. He's a sinner. What's the difference between inherit and earn? Yeah, inherit is a, it's a gift, and yet earn. And yet, what does the guy say in Mark 10, 17? Doesn't he seem to uh, confuse the terminology? What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? You don't, you don't do anything to inherit. The inheritance comes natural by birth. You can lose an inheritance. You can't gain one. Um, so what does this young man show when he believes about how one is saved? By works. Then... Notice that Jesus doesn't bring up the first table of commandments here. What are the first table of commandments, the first three? Love God. Don't take his name in vain. Remember Saturday, keep it holy. He doesn't mention any of those three. He only goes to the second table. And the second table deals with your relationships with who? Your neighbor. Your neighbor. So he's going he's gonna to hit him hard on the neighbor side. Because he really doesn't understand God, apparently, in Jesus' terms. We gotta go and understand that you are a sinner towards your neighbor. So these are the commandments, what were they? And you know, he doesn't necessarily list them in order as we have in the book of Exodus, but he does cover uh, all of them. Um, which reading, what uh, there's were a reading that says, what lack I yet? Because he believes what about these commandments? What does he believe about all the, of the second table? He's fulfilling them all. But there's a problem, right? If he fulfilled them all, we know there's a problem because he's doing what? He's not boasting. He's just not at peace, right? Why is? Why do we know he's not at peace? <laughs> he's asking, what do I need to do? I, I, I thought I'm doing all these seven, but still I'm, I don't have peace within my heart here. And, and where does he think... Who does he think can help him get his problem resolved? 
Jesus. Yeah, he goes to the master, the good master, the good Confucius, my guy. You know, the man full of wisdom. Not, not, not God in himself, but a man full of wisdom. Good master, good Confucius teacher. Uh, what must I do to inherit eternal life? It sounds like one of those questions a student of Confucius asked. Confucius, you know, what must I do? And um, Jesus wants to uh, tell him there's nothing you can do. And he says, I've done all of these and I still don't have peace in my heart. What am I lacking? Why do I have this problem in my life? Um, so in the end, Jesus asked the young man to obey what commandment first? And what, how, how, how does St. Paul say all the commandments are fulfilled in one word? What is that word? Love. So he's asking the young man to obey the commandment of love. What question do you think Jesus would ask you? I'm not going to ask you to answer this question. To give up helping you see your violation of this commandment of loving God before all things. This man loved what? Money. He he was faulty in the first table. So he lists the, he lists the second, but we're going to now go address the first table. And you love money. And that's your that's your problem. That was his problem. Is that every one of our problems is the same? No, I, I think I, I envision this, that if we were struggling with having peace with God and we were to go to Jesus and ask, what must I do? I bet you he would give us a different answer for every one of us. Would you not agree with that? We're all individuals and we all have our weaknesses. This guy's weaknesses was what? Money. Money. Ours is going to be something else. It's not going to be, people say, well, I'm, I'm good to go because I don't love money. No, that's not the point of the story here. You've got a weakness. And, and, and out of all the people in the world, Jesus will, will put a, a microscope on it and a, and a spotlight on it. He's going to show you your weakness. And he's going to drive you to your knees. And he's going to make you feel guilty about the weakness. Whatever is struggling with us with peace with God, believe it or not, Jesus knows what it is. And it'll be a different answer for every one of us. Every one of us. So after Jesus focuses on his weakness, how does the, how does the man respond, verse 22? He's sorrowful. He feels guilty. So at this point in time, what should the young man do? Repent. Does he repent? And what do you think Jesus feels about him at the end? If you look at verse uh, 21, how did Jesus feel towards him? He loved him. And when this man walks away without repentance, how do you think Jesus feels? I don't regret, but just sad. Sad. I told you what your problem is. Now you're not going to do anything about it. You're going to go live in your misery all your life. I'm here to help you out of your misery. You came seeking my help, and now you reject my counsel. Um, didn't bring about repentance for this guy. It made him feel sorrowful, but he didn't come out and say, I'm sorry. I, I have sinned against God and against man. So he didn't get to that point. Uh, Nathan, confronted, uh, Nathan confronted David about his sin, and David said, I have sinned. 
you know, uh, the prodigal son, he comes home and what does he tell his father? They have sinned. And this man does not say, I have sinned. Uh, it's just, it's a sad story. It's a sad story that we uh, see Jesus outreaching to us and telling us what's wrong with us. I kind of mentioned in the message this morning through the word. Uh, and yet he rejects the counsel of the teacher from whom he thought had all the wisdom in the world and uh, just couldn't do it. Just couldn't do it. You know what they say in the book of Proverbs, right? You should, you should, how should you look upon a person who tells you what your problem is? You should consider him wise. That's the book of Proverbs. A wise man, consider a man wise who, who rebukes you for your errors. Consider man what when the man refuses to tell you your errors? What's the opposite of being a wise? Foolish. Foolish. Consider a man foolish when he will not tell you what's wrong with you. Why does the person not want to tell you what's wrong with you many times? Because they don't want to lose you as a friend. But if friends are going to be honest with you, and hopefully in friendship you'll receive this correction. Can it be? Uh, I've tried doing that with Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It points back right back at you. Yeah. And, and if you were in the early service today, what was the one danger that's noted about self-help books about what they want to do with your problems? Blame someone else rather than look in the mirror. You see, this is, this is what Jesus does. He's, he's going to say, you're accountable for yourself. Don't, don't be blaming your mom. Don't be blaming, you know, the government. You are accountable for yourself. Um, so... How can people be led to trust in riches for heavenly security? What do they see riches as a sign of? Back in those days, if you were rich, you were understood that you must be right with God. Yeah, work righteousness. It's prosperity gospel. It's, it's existing for ages. Now, is Jesus talking about an actual eye of a needle here? Uh, better for the camel to go through an eye of a needle. Scholars look at this there are two different ways. One is, yes, he's talking literally that a camel can't go through that little eye of a needle. But in, in the Jerusalem walls, there's all gates. There's the gate of well, the gate of fish and the gate of sheep. So what do you think was being brought in those gates? The gate of sheep, they were bringing what into Jerusalem? Sheep. The gate of fish is facing the ocean, the Mediterranean Sea. They would, they would bring the fish in through the gate. And there was one gate called the needle gate. Very, very narrow. And some scholars say Jesus was referring to that, but but to do that kind of weakens the metaphor to say that he was referring to that needle gate where it's very, very thin that camels could not get through that needle gate. Um, to strengthen the metaphor, you would say, no, he's actually referring to the eye of a needle pin. Um, but the truth of the matter is he's communicating a message of impossibility. That's how strong you want to make that metaphor depends how literal you want to take it. So when this conversation is over, why do people wonder if anyone can be saved? Uh, you know, Peter says, Lord, if this, if this is true, that if a needle, if a camel can't get through the eye of a needle, how can anyone be saved? Uh, if it's easier for a camel to do that than a rich man to get into heaven. What is Peter recognizing about himself? He loves what? He loves money too. You know? Jesus, everybody loves money. <laughs> how, how is anybody going to be saved? Because I can't find anybody in my circle of friends that doesn't love money. And Jesus says, yeah, it's, uh, you're right. With man, it's impossible. But with God. Mm -hmm. 
Right. Yeah, it's given to us by God, but and it is it's a gift of grace. Again, what Jesus is communicating to Peter and all the disciples is, you know, no one can get saved on their own efforts. It's all a gift of grace. Um, and we have all of our weaknesses, and if we just confess them, uh, God will give us forgiveness and open up the gates of heaven for us. But the other aspect is, is we can't take it for granted either. Uh, we can't take it for granted any. Why do you, what do you think Peter was looking for by giving up things to follow Jesus? You know, he says, I've given up everything, right? Uh, yeah. Uh, where is it he says he's given up everything? What verse is it? 28? Yeah, Peter said to him, Lo, we've left all and followed thee. So what's what's in it for me? Peter was not just from this we understand Peter and many of the disciples are just not following Jesus because he was some great teacher. They were looking to get something in the end. What? Reward. Reward. I gave up everything. I gave up my fishing career. I, I left my wife. I, I don't I don't know if he had any kids, but he left his wife, he gave up his fishing career. And he was following Jesus for three years. We should be getting something here. And Jesus said, yeah, you will, but when? Probably not now, but later. But what can Peter expect in the world now, according to Mark 10, 30? He's going to get what? He's going to get eternal life coming to faith. But ahead of the eternal life, what is he going to be receiving? What does the Christian receive in this world? Persecution. That's your reward, Peter. How would you guys like that for a reward? Persecution. <laughs> uh, so, what's the legend of Peter? What happened to Peter? The legend is he was crucified upside down. Yeah. Uh, and why was he crucified upside down? Crucified upside, right side up, because of, that's the way his, his master died. Um, so, who are the family and sisters and brothers that believers receive in this life? The church. Church. And, uh, well, we have to compare all three gospel readers to finish that last question. Which is more clearly communicated that believers to receive rewards in this life? Uh, we do receive some rewards. One of them is persecution, but uh, we do receive a family, a Christian family, to surround us. And and there's a lot of broken families out there. Wouldn't you agree? And 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 they stand in need of a family. Um, why are gangs so prevalent? Why? That it's their family. You know it. it Maslow's hierarchy of needs, one, two, three in the pyramid. The third family, the third highest need of the human being is love and a sense of belonging. Where do you get a sense of belonging from? From a family. If you don't have it from a family, you're gonna find one or create one and that's where gangs come into play. A lot of these kids who join gangs come from what type of families? Broken families. Um, and, and I know our politicians are trying to do everything they can, both Democrats and Republicans, to try and build that family uh, family institution together. But both of them are coming at it at different angles. They do. Both of them are, are out there. They understand. Actually, both parties have said that the success of the country is based on the family. If you have strong families, your country will be strong. And that goes back to the fourth commandment, right? Honor your father and your mother, that may be well with you and you live long on earth. That word you is not, is not second person singular, it's second person plural. So what the fourth commandment promises a country is it will prosper and have longevity if what exists in the country, respect. Honor and respect your authorities because the moment you lose honor and respect you lead into chaos and chaos leads into destruction 
And that's where the devil wants us to go all the time. So family unity, teaching honor and respect, basically you know, the rest of the family extends into the government. And yes, you know, you, we've got all issues with the government, whatever they may be, but both parties and both, I think, philosophers will say, if you want a country to be strong, the family unit's got to be strong. And you see these broken families, they've got to be addressed, but both parties come at it from different angles. Both of them know, we got to do something about the family. But one side may say, we got to do this. Another side may say, no, we do it this way. And the two of them never meet. And so the family continues to suffer. Um, but uh, it is, it is in, in my opinion, and from what many people say, it is the core of our problem, is we have so many broken families in our world today. So many broken families. They don't understand the concept of love. They don't understand the concept of belonging. They don't understand the concept of responsibility. They don't understand the concept of order. It's very, very difficult. I mean, anybody of our teachers here today? I mean, I know Cecilia substitute teaches over it, but it just seems that the disruption of the family is becoming more and more evident in the school system. How do we, how do, how do teachers notice that those families are getting disrupted by what? Um, by, by order in the classroom. It's just kids are not being, they don't get their homework done. Uh, they don't respect their teachers. They don't respect one another. You know, it's just, it, it just seems the problem every year is getting worse and worse and worse. And the school doesn't know what to do because again, what do you do with a family? How do you, how do you strengthen that? And that's where the church can help, you know, especially with these broken families, is if we can find a way to outreach to them and say, hey, we have a healthy family for you to join us. Maybe we can outreach to these kids and high school kids and elementary school kids and, and, and to try to start a youth ministry among these kids to keep them away from gangs and give them a healthy family. Yeah, they're, they're out of school, I'm sorry. Yeah, they're, they're, they're on concept because now kids growing up, they think it's not all church. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's like Well, you take God out of, of out of the equation, then who becomes God? When you when you eliminate when you take the God of Christ out of the equation, who then fills the void? We do. Man. Yeah. Man does. You know, and it, it, might, like, it could lead to government, but, but there's a book by John Newhouse, The Naked Public Square, um, and he, he, he would argue the same thing. We, a country cannot, uh, nature abhors a vacuum. You've heard that phrase. So if you take God out of your society, you create a vacuum. Something must fill it. We cannot survive in a society of morals in a vacuum. Some other morals are going to fill that vacuum when God is taken out. And basically what John Newhouse argues is when people take God out of the society, that vacuum gets filled with humanism, which is man. Man's gonna make, man's gonna make the judgment. Man's gonna be the measure of all things rather than God. So anyway, we'll you we got Donna, you got one? Right. Right. That's the only other place that they can learn any kind of uh, structure behavior. Yeah. So what do you do? Yeah, it's, it's, it's impossible for teachers to fill the void and the school system to fill the void of the broken family. Is it impossible for the church? I don't think so. I think the church has the moral structure. I think the church has God. I think the church has the true concept of love because we talk that Jesus is love. Uh, and and, and that unfortunately, the schools can't talk about this stuff, but we can. And that's, again, you know, when you're talking about the vision committees and formulating here, one of the things that the vision committee has to say, what, if, what is our strength as Christians? <laughs> and one of the strengths of Christians in the center of this world is that we have a concept of love the world does not. Maybe we need to get that message out a little bit better, you know? That, that God loves all people, even Buffalo Bill fans, Tim Bo. <laughs> <laughs>
Can you hear that, Tim? Yeah. <laughs> Let's close with prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your many blessings, especially the blessings of love you bestow upon us as your sons and daughters. Help us, O Lord, communicate this message of love where it means and involves also correction and discipline as Jesus loved this young man and uh, strive to correct him, to show him the error of his ways, and yet the young man walks away. So even, O oh Lord, we see sometimes our Savior is not 100% successful. So that's all into your mystery and wisdom why these things take place. But help us, O oh Lord, understand that sometimes uh, frustrations and disappointments should not stop us from striving. Give us the power and the strength to continue to plod forward into this world by sharing the true concept of love you bestowed upon us through Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. Amen.